have a special presentation on Ensemble, so take it away. Uh, just one second here. Okay. All right, so um, a lot of people have probably heard of Ensemble, and many of you probably don't know what it does if you're outside of the, the server team. So we just wanted to take a few minutes uh, to give people a chance to understand what this is. Um, Ensemble is a new effort, uh, primarily being pushed by Canonical now, but we hope to open that up, and that's one of the things that we want to uh, make very clear to people as a result of this introduction. Uh, this is a new piece of software. It's new ideas about how to do service deployment of software in the cloud. Um, but the software itself is maturing rapidly. E even though it's young, uh, it's thoroughly tested, it's reasonably well documented, and the point that we want people to walk away with is that it's, if you want to evaluate this, now is the time to do that. If you want to help collaborate, take a hand in the development, it's a wonderful time to to step up and let us know that you're interested. Uh, so right now, uh, we primarily target people that write formulas and DevOps sysadmin type people. And what I mean by that is the way that services work uh, is that we have a formula, which um, other tool chains might call something like a recipe, but it's a way of encapsulating the behavioral um, dependencies of the service so that it can be deployed in the cloud and relate to other things. And I'll, I'll show that because it's much easier to understand when you see it. Um, so without further ado, um, there are a few steps in deploying and running software. And I just want to show what those are from the prompt as, as you might first encounter this. There's one first step uh, that involves bootstrapping space on EC2, and that can take a few minutes. Since I only have a few minutes, I'm going to skip that step. But uh, when you first encounter this system, it would be uh, bin ensemble bootstrap. So I've already done that. What? Ah. Yeah, that might be. OK. Um, so th what I'm going to do, uh, and hopefully <laughs> the one thing I didn't check is that my networking is going, but I think, I think we're OK. Um, so the first thing we do is we want to deploy services. In this example, and this sort of the, we, we jokingly call it the canonical example, uh, we'll deploy uh, WordPress and MySQL to the cloud, get it running, and show how that, that works. Um, so. Uh, deploy repository examples. So what this is actually doing is connecting to the cloud environment that we previously bootstrapped. Um, it's going to allocate machines. Now, we have an instance of WordPress running, and I, I will prove that shortly. Uh, but I know that WordPress uh, depends on a database. Um, and this will give an idea of how simple it is to do this. So we, we have a formula for WordPress, so when I mentioned formulas, and we have a formula for MySQL. We're deploying both and making sure that those run. And then once that's up, I'm going to add a relationship between the two that effectively connects them. Now what's interesting is that the author of the WordPress formula would simply say, I depend on a particular style of database interface. And uh, in this case, MySQL implements that. They didn't necessarily have to, there's no pre-planned um, coordination here. Other things, for example, could use MySQL. Uh, but in this case, we're going to just do this. So here I'm effectively saying to Ensemble, create a, a link, a relationship between these uh, two services. And that works. And now I want to sort of see what Ensemble's done. So I will invoke this status command, which will spit out a bunch of um, 
status information about the cloud deployment. And from there, uh, I should be able to. So there, there's a lot of information here. And, and maybe this is confusing to the, the first time user. But uh, what it's showing is a list of provision machines um, in the cloud. So one of those instances is running WordPress. One is running MySQL. Those are listed as services. You can see what formulas they're running. There's uh, a relationship between MySQL and WordPress. Uh, one, of the, one of the nice things about that, before I actually, hopefully no one steals my WordPress. Uh, so let's see. What, where's the cursor? So machine one. Someone is faster than me. I'm going to lose this. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is the deployment uh, done with just a few quick commands. It's set up. What's interesting is that. Um, well, let me let me just show you one other piece. This is from an earlier run, but. Uh, it's exactly illustrative of how this works. Um, this is, we can just do uh, dot style um, dumps of what it looks like. So in this, this is a previous iteration of the same example, MySQL, WordPress. You can see the uh, provision machines and the relationship between them. What's interesting is that within the service for WordPress, for example, if WordPress were under heavy strain and the formula was able to deal with this, we could add additional units, provision more units of cloud, and apply them to that service. And if, as long as the formulas take this into account, and they should, um, things scale uh, horizontally very, very well. Um, and it's just a couple more commands that I'll have time to show in this demo. But uh, we do have examples of running these things with Siege or, or AB, and you can scale them out very easily. Um, and that's, that's kind of exciting. It's nice to be able to visualize this. Um, so yeah. Uh, so yeah, WordPress is, is working. Um, let me try to find where I put my presentation. Yeah, I don't, what? Yeah, it's not, uh, it's not taking the keystroke, actually. Sometimes it gets stuck. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to find my cursor here. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, I <laughs> no rush, right? Um, yeah, except it doesn't really fit. Ah, uh, well. So <laughs> I had this working. Um, all right, now there we go. So um, some important points about the demo. I know I've got to get through this really quickly, but I've only got a couple of points left. Uh, what's interesting is that right now as a convenience, some of it's not stock. But basically what we're talking about when we do these deployments are stock Ubuntu server, stock Ubuntu packages. So we're completely taking advantage of the things that Ubuntu already does very well. We're not trying to replace or that. We, we want to use those. The things that are added are formula authors writing hooks that control the behavior and linking between these services. And that can be done, right now I say implementer's choice. Um, it can be done in any language, using any tool chain, anything you want. They just get invoked at the appropriate time. 
presumably do the correct actions, and this is all described in the documentation, and you get things like WordPress talking to a database where they've exchanged credentials and so on, and everything just behaves. Um, so if this is interesting, the development is all public, the communication is out in the open, I wouldn't say that developers are on IRC 24 hours a day, but probably any given 18, you can find at least one of us there. Um, so I invite you all to look in Launchpad, uh, find us on the new website. We're going to be adding more content to that very shortly. And uh, if you have questions, come and find us uh, tonight, and we'd be happy to, happy to talk about how people can become involved or if uh, your use cases are addressed or not. So thank you. Okay, now we're going to move on to the lightning talks. All right, lightning talks. I'm going to set up here. If the soundboard could uh, apply maximum volume to the laptop, that would be help helpful. All right, I'm going to actually use the other mic. Thank you. All right, is it live? Good. So thanks for coming to the Lightning Talks. I'm Randall Ross. Uh, I'm from Vancouver, BC, Canada. I'm going to give you a quick uh, 10 minutes or less, I guess. Five minutes or less? OK, I've got 50 slides, so we're going to go quickly. Magnifying Ubuntu community tenfold. And notice I said Ubuntu community tenfold. Tenfold is an order of magnitude, and that's where we need to go. So I have five minutes, two goals. Uh, goal number one is to catalyze community growth. Goal number two is to provide a concrete example of how that was done in Vancouver. Standard disclaimers apply. I'm not a developer, okay? So that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind. And these opinions are only my own opinions. They're not necessarily science. So why do this? Why magnify the Ubuntu community tenfold? Well, we need 200 million users in four years, and we're not going to get there simply by creating great software. Great software really helps us get there, but another thing that's going to help us get there is building a fan base. And if we can uh, leverage community and community development to build a fan base, we'll get to 200 million users probably a lot faster than four years. How are we going to do it? First, we need to recognize that it's possible. How many people in here live in a city? All right, everyone lives in a city. How many people think there are Ubuntu users in their city? All right. How many people have a local community group in their city? Uh, slightly fewer hands. How many people lead a local community group? Even fewer hands. Great. So recognize that are, there are at least 1% of the population of your city, again, caveat supply, that use Ubuntu. And all they really need is a person, a lightning rod, to attract them to an Ubuntu event, and that could be you. So be a catalyst or find one. If you're not someone who wants to be a lightning rod, find one who is someone who's very social, someone who's very loud, noisy, flamboyant, whatever. And uh, crack them down and convince them this is a good thing to do. Once you've found them or once you're doing it yourself, you need messages that will resonate in your community. And there are different ones depending on who you're talking to. Uh, we like to talk about the money train. Why do you keep shipping money south to places in California for your software? That resonates with some people. Uh, what, do you want to fix bug number one? Well, we need a big swarm of birds to do it, right? Uh, programmer be programmed. Some of you may have read Douglas Rushcroft's book. Basically, he says, if you're not a programmer, meaning a contributor, in the information age, you are being programmed. So that's another message that might resonate. This one resonates with some people, freedom. So always choose your messages appropriately. Try and target your community. This message doesn't seem to work in our community. People aren't, just, aren't necessarily interested in three of these quadrants, okay? They're very interested in the bottom right quadrant, but they kind of tune out when you talk about the other ones. Um, when you're marketing, try and go where the people are. Go where the community is. Don't expect the community to come to you. So you want to go to places like Meetup, meetup.com. There's a great community already built online there, Facebook, Twitter, all kinds of online communities, great places to go. You'll attract mainly people who are comfortable online. That may not be the people in your community. Go to farmer's markets. Go to places that have real people at them who don't use computers very often and who aren't comfortable with them. 
make it easy for people. Once they find you, once they see you at a farmer's market, they want to join your group, give them something that makes it easy. Give them a new user resource guide so that they understand what your group is and isn't and how it can help them become more, uh, more capable in Ubuntu and probably get them to the point where they're someday contributors. Give them a map. Show them what your community looks like. If you have different events, show them those events. If you have different places in your community that they should know about, draw them. People like that. Um, offer support events. We do support Saturdays in Vancouver. These are uh, support heroes in your top left quadrant. Uh, general public in the bottom right quadrant come in. Anyone off the street can come in and get support on Ubuntu. Have theme nights, talk about fun stuff. Natty Narwhals are fun, and everyone might want to sing this song. You want to sing this song? No, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> Results. Okay, all of this is just hype, unless you can back it up with something, right? Okay, I'm going to show you what happened in Vancouver. I joined Vancouver, Ubuntu Vancouver Local just over two years ago. We had, at my first meeting, we had five people. I estimated there were probably 50 people who had come and gone through the group. That's two years ago. Uh, we grew that community significantly, and we added people who uh, don't use Ubuntu. We added a lot of people, sorry for the colors there, but almost a quarter of the group does not use Ubuntu. We now have 500 members, so in two years we have magnified by a factor of 10, an order of magnitude, exactly what we need to do for Ubuntu. Cool. This is where we are, not, interested, not interesting to you, you don't live there. So, anyways, this is that, this is us. This is us. Notice the diversity in the group. This is our Treat Tuesday. This is our party. While I'm messing about with my laptop, hooking it up to the monitors, I was wondering if everyone here who uses Launchpad could please stand up. Seriously, stand up. Come on, come on, stand up. Everyone here who uses Launchpad, please stand up. Now, can you please stay standing if you get too much bug email from Launchpad? <laughs> Excellent. I've got news for you. Please sit down. You better sit down, for this is pretty good news. I have five things that the Launchpad team have done recently to make your lives better. Five things to do with bug mail. It's done coincidentally by these five people, not me, these five guys. First thing we've done, we've changed it so that if you don't want to, you will not get mailed for stuff that you did. This means you will not, here's how you do it. Um, this is Launchpad. You go to change your details. And then you scroll down, and then you say, check that box that says, send me bug notifications of changes that I make. First thing, don't get mail for stuff you did. Second thing, we now have providing you new tools to take control of your bug mail. So this is the Linux package in Launchpad. Um, subscribe to bug mail. You can now choose uh, to subscribe yourself, give it a name, choose to be subscribed to only bugs with a certain tag, like a certain importances, a certain statuses. Three, you can mute individual bugs. So say if you've got a mute bug email. Four, unsubscribe in anger. So what happens? So you'll get mail from a bug, there'll be a link at the bottom, and it'll let you, it'll give you a, lot, a bunch of options like this, saying how you want to unsubscribe. It, it's a, because there's so many ways you can get email, we had to give you this interface. Fifth feature, 
uh, you can view all of your subscriptions for a project. So you can go to something like this, like test tools, my project, you should use it. And there's a list of um, how ways I'm subscribed, which I can edit. Or I could say, even though I'm still a member of this team, I don't want mail just because I'm a member of this team. So stop my mail from this subscription. Five things that we're doing for you for bug email. But there's, uh, and there's also a bunch of stuff related to that. There's way more SMTP headers. We're batching attachment mail. And if you make a mistake and correct it, you're not going to get a mail about it. This is currently in beta. If you join Launchpad beta testers, you will get these features. We're releasing them live on production on May 23rd. And I want to tell you three other things that the Launchpad team has been doing that has got nothing to do with email at all, but I think are pretty cool. First off, um, there are now daily bills from branches into PPAs. Martin Poole did a talk about this recently. It makes it really, really, really easy to have a branch in whatever VCS you want and then get it built into a PPA every day if the branch changes. We now have excellent uh, upstream translation syncing. You can get stuff from an upstream translations project, and then it'll be, uh, become a suggestion uh, when you're translating it in Ubuntu. And also massive performance improvements. I would not have done, gone to the live website this time last year. I would have used screenshots. We have massively improved our performance. Um, thank you. Now, now, there are four things that I want to talk to you about after those. Uh, you saw, you looked around, and you saw all of these people, all of these wonderful people who are using Launchpad to do really excellent stuff. I'm going to tell you four ways that you can help them. Four ways to help Launchpad help Ubuntu. First off, you can hammer Launchpad. Uh, we're regularly releasing features. We blog about the features when they come out. If you, want to, if you could help us by joining Launchpad beta testers, using those features, and then reporting bugs. Two. Um, we do extensive user testing of our new features. Well, no, we do user testing of our new features. As we're developing them, we, take, we, we, do, we send out mock-ups to get people to try them out. We've been doing some at UDS. Um, it's hard to find people who can test Launchpad because it's just not your random Joe from the street. We need you, so contact Matthew Ravel. Three, you can extend Launchpad. You can write uh, API tools. You can contribute to LP tools, which is currently what we're trying to recommend for shared library stuff. And four, you can patch Launchpad. I'm not going to kid you, it's not easy, but it's so worth it. You get to help all of these people and get thunderous applause like I got earlier, and really should have gone to the, uh, to the five guys before. So thank you very much. Stay in touch. That's where we hang up. We're very friendly. You're all wonderful. Beginning page up. No. You got it from here. <laughs> so this happens to you. You go to see your local team. It's like your release party, and you walk in, and you're all excited because you've been slaving on this stuff. And someone guy comes up to you, goes, "You guys broke my wireless again." You go, "Ah." Oh. Has this happened to anyone before? <laughs> okay. As it ends up. Um, you ask him how he ended up in that state, and you find out that he read some official guide somewhere or some unofficial guide somewhere else. And what happened? He followed it, and next thing you know, he's running NBIS wrapper instead of something else, and then he does an upgrade, and I'm pretty much sick of that. So the problem. You guys have it. Hey, wait, I fixed this bug. Why are you still having this problem and bugging me about it? You know, this happens a lot with the kernel team. The cause, I will go into. But first, a question. What does this mean? It means seven years of my life. It means, no, I mean, you know, it means a lot of things to a lot of people. The quality of this symbol is very important to us. And right now, that symbol is being slogged through the mud because too much information on the internet is wrong and it's hurting our users. So you ever get this thing, the guy's like, hey, your uh, boot splash isn't the right resolution. I can fix that for you. And they do, and then you broke your bootloader. It's like, is it worth it? But people are doing it. Why are they? Because a lot of people are to blame. Right? <laughs> you better come in here and patch your kernel. Otherwise, you're, ugh, you guys know. So who's to blame? So 19 Linux guy is like our favorite because he's the loudest guy in the lug usually, and people listen to him. And you don't know why, but you don't say anything. Right? Experts need peer review. Uh, I posted an answer on Ask Ubuntu, and I thought it was right, and Colin Watson came down and gave me a down vote. <laughs> Everybody needs peer review, because everyone makes mistakes. 
blogs and news site. How many times have you seen this? If a blog or news site has the words daily PPA in it, users shouldn't be using it. And if they are, you're full of fail. If you're one of those news site people out there, I know where you are. Stop! <laughs> and you and me, we let this happen. Now we have to clean up this mess. So it's, it's, it's fun to make fun of other people, um, but we fail to lead by example in one critical area, the Ubuntu Wiki. So I'm going to ask everyone here to do one thing. Delete something. <laughs> this cycle, I want you to delete more pages than you make. I don't care if somebody tells you Linux is about choice, I want to put my end disk wrapper. No, delete it. Gone. And then after that, keep it gone and kill it with fire. <laughs> so, show of hands, I, state your name. I will delete at least five wiki pages this cycle. <laughs> there are hundreds of thousands. I talked to IS. I was like, will this make a dent? They're like, no. F <laughs> Everyone in this room, five wiki pages gone. And if someone yells at you and you, they have to rewrite it, I would rather have someone rewrite it with current stuff than someone trying to load the kernel modules from Breezy, who knows how they still get them, right, into like their Lucid thing and breaking your thing. So please, if someone gets in your way, move around. Delete. That's all. Thank you. Okay, I've added a bunch of new features to uh, Biobu that I want to show off uh, using a video. Hopefully we've got sound, sound on, and... Mm -hmm. I'm floating in the plimbola. You're now prompted the first time you press Control A as to whether you want it to operate in Emacs mode or screen mode. I'm swimming weightless in the wall, or bouncing gently round the room. In a minute, I'll be free, and you'll be splashing in the sea. Splashing in the sea We'll hear a tiny cry As the ship goes sliding by Horizontal spring splits Free. It's over EC2, by the way. Scroll back is now alt page up, alt page down. This is also a BI like search mode, so you can search forward and backward for regular expressions in your history. Vertical splits. Which are preserved over detach and reattach. And you can split ad nauseum, combine vertical and horizontal splits. So you have a splitting headache. Feature request this week was to disable all the eye candy for a much simpler, cleaner mode. The over quiet. Of course, you can undo that.
Lots of new indicators that only show up when they actually make sense. They perform better. My name is James Westby, and I'm a serial lightning talk failure. <laughs> yes. So, you've just seen a WYSI user interface. You're going to see a lot more today, and I'm going to show you the best kind of software, one that has virtually no user interface whatsoever. So who thinks packaging is too difficult? I've just written this tool, and it has no packaging. So I run one command, and now it has packaging. <laughs> uh, I can then actually build it. I've forgotten my key ID then. Whoa. Right, now I can build it. And obviously it's young, so we need to do that. And then I can... It's obviously not perfect. It Lintian complains, but Lintian complains at everything. Then you sign your package, <laughs> and you upload it to Launchpad, and we can wrap that into one command, which will take you from an unpackaged piece of software to having it in your PPA so other people can try it out. If you've ever wanted to use a piece of software which was unpackaged, then this could be the tool for you. Right now, it works thanks to some help from Barry Warsaw on Python packages. Thanks to Michael Terry, it works on Vala packages. And thanks to you guys, it's going to work on every single piece of software out there. If you're in the Java community and you want it to work on Java, if you're in the KDE community and you want it to work on KDE, if you want to have more applications from your community available on Ubuntu, then come and contribute to this tool. Head to packageme.net and go to the link which says package me backends and read this and write the like three ten line shell scripts it takes to actually implement this for your particular piece of software. If it doesn't quite do what you want, Come and talk to me and we'll make it do what you want so that you can provide this benefit to developers out there who want to get their applications on Ubuntu but don't want to think about packaging. It completely takes care of all of that. It would never get past review, but who cares about review in this case? <laughs> so um, the other thing which I need help with is improving the website and actually packaging the tool itself because I can't be bothered anymore. So. <laughs> I want to see it in Ubuntu, and yeah, that's too much work. So uh, thanks, everyone, and I'll see you next time. Wow, a room full of geeks. That's intimidating. Okay, so I'm here to talk about Flask. Um, I'm totally going to fanboy over my favorite tool. And not this Flask, but this Flask. So Flask is a Python micro framework, which you've probably heard about. And it's based on these, which I can't pronounce, and good intentions. It's BSC licensed, so you can build whatever you want with it. And it's full of awesome. 
And the other thing which I really like about it is that it doesn't force you to use MVC or any sort of architecture. You just build what you want. And it has a very low barrier of entry for someone who wants to do web development. So this is what Hello World in Flask looks like. Um, well, the most simplest application. And it does do templates, which I have not shown in the example back there. And it does do uh, flash messaging. And it does deal with redirects, logging, extensions. There's a whole bunch of extensions out there. And there's testing, which you know I'm looking into right now. And it does scale to huge applications. Like this is something that uh, my friend built. It's a job board, which you can see the URL right there. And it's entirely built on Flask. Uh, I think we took about um, three weeks to build the whole thing. And participating in it is quite easy, because the code is very easy to read. These are the links you might want. Uh, stuff powered by Flask, documentation, the job board source code, and my talks, whatever. Thank you. While this is not a redneck fairy tale, so I'm not starting it off with, hey, y'all, watch this. But um, we are going to talk about a kind of serious subject, but with a, um, no, I'm going to stay right here, I promise. Um, <laughs> in a kind of a lighthearted way, because I like tongue-in-cheek approaches to difficult situations. So this is not the type of trolling we're going to be talking about. While it looks like it would be an interesting topic, we'll, take, we'll save that for another day. So both of these are trolls, and, and sometimes trolls can be cute. They're cute ways. And sometimes trolls are very ugly. Both can inflict harm. Forms of bait. While minnows, worms, and grasshoppers are bait, this is not the type of bait we're going to be talking about in this trolling talk. What is a troll? How many of you guys, if I even say the name, say troll, you know exactly what I'm talking about? Because either you've accidentally been one, or you've been the victim of one. I can say both, and I'm going to give you examples of both here in a moment. What's baiting? How many of you guys ever accidentally baited anybody? Accidentally, right? <laughs> how, how many of you guys ever like been the recipient of that bait? Mailing lists, forums, IRC. People who intentionally put comments in an online forum, online community that really um, have nothing to do with that topic, but they just want to disrupt um, the conversation. That's bullying. You've been bullied? Yeah, mean behavior. Don't be a meanie head. Don't be mean to people. Don't intentionally um, create an environment where people are mean to other people. So while we have rude and bullying behavior and baiting behavior and trollish behavior, they're all forms of exclusion. And they all exclude people. So, yeah. I remember three years ago, I first joined an IRC channel. Not an Ubuntu IRC channel, I'll clarify that. Um, it was another distribution, but, and I wanted to ask questions, and uh, I got told RTFM. I felt kind of hurt. But in the southern world, we would just say, he can't find his manual. Bless his heart. Now, I'm going to tell on me a little bit, because the reason I got involved with this talk wasn't because I have a passion about trolling or people not trolling. It was because it was brought up to me that I troll people in the community. And I'll give you an example. Many of you know my husband is the current manager here. Well, when I first got involved, a lot of people didn't know that. And we happened to be in an event, and um, it was OzCon about three years ago. And I said uh, something to the effect of, yeah, who's, who the, whose idea was it to hire that canonical colonel manager? What a jerk. Well, I was just joking and, and didn't realize that people took those comments seriously. And someone found me in the booth that I was in and literally got in my face and put their finger in my face and said, Pete Grainer, blah, 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 and literally went down his resume of his contributions in open source. And I said, do you know him? <laughs> Can you introduce me to him? And of course they said, I haven't met him yet, but when I do, I'll bring him over. Well, that was the first incident. The second incident was I said, who the hell is John O'Bacon and why do I care? <laughs> John is a good friend of mine. And so the person came up to me and was explaining to me the merits of John O'Bacon. And again, I said, do you know him? 
Can you introduce me to him? This same person, and I have since tracked this person down and apologized to them, um, was standing with me and explaining the merits of, of Jono and Pete. And um, they walk up to me and they both say, hey, what are you doing for lunch? And the guy's face turned white. Because at that point he realized that I knew them. And I thought that was kind of cute and funny. But as I explored this topic, I realized I was the troll. I was baiting people. So there's that fine line between being cute and being funny and actually excluding people and hurting their feelings. So now I'm more sensitive to that topic. So let's look at some other examples. Did they shut your Google off? Let me Google that for you. You know, the way your code runs, it's already late for a kernel panic. How many of you guys can tell your code sucks? I wouldn't say that, but I'm sure somebody does. And that's, those are rude behaviors. You could use some more training, you know. Anyway, I had to make this family friendly. My first presentation wasn't so family friendly. We've talked about baiting and flaming and what that is, where it happens online in communities. You know, any online community, it can happen. That's the ugly troll. We don't want to get to that. We don't want rude behavior to escalate to that point. Are we done? Is that what that bell means? All right, so you got to know, don't feed the trolls, don't feed the trolls. When all else fails, bless your heart, translated. Okay, I'm talking about new tools in Ubuntu DevTools. Oh. Let's try to... Okay, raise your hand if you use at least one script from DevTools. Okay, many of you. Next question. Raise your hand if you know wrap and sort. Oh, only a few. Raise your hand if you use it. OK. I'm doing live demo now. Uh, so let's take one package and look at the control file. And there we have a really long list of build dependencies totally unstructured and really hard to read, for example, especially if you want to um, apply a patch. Then it's hard to see which build dependencies was, was added and which one was removed. And this applies also for the dependencies and uh, um, recommends, replaces, breaks, and so on. What wrap and sort does is it takes all these lists um, and sort the lists and wrap the, them so that on each line you have exactly one item. So let's run wrap and sort and see what happened to the control file. And you can see, recommends is also ordered. And uh, it tries to not extend 80 characters per line. It takes uh, several options if you like uh, other format of styling, but that's the way it goes. It also removes trailing spaces. Um, it works on install files. and other kind of lists. Oh. For example, you can see it touches the control file. It removes some trailing spaces from the copyright file and or as the install file. So, but it's not the only script. Raise your hand if you know sponsor patch. Okay, 
Next question. Raise your hand if you use Bonza Patch. Okay. <laughs> oh. So, Sponsor Patch is a nice tool if you want to sponsor a patch. Um, let's take a look at the sponsors queue and take an example. For example, let's take the second one from the bottom. We go to the bug and see that there is a adaptive att attached to it. So we take the bug number and oh, launch sponsor patch with the bug number. And OK, I have specified a working directory. And let's see what happened. happens. So it, what it does, it grabs the source package for the um, bug. It grabs the adaptive. It applies it. It does some sanity checks. For example, is this launchpad bug closed? With this patch, does it does a um, patch target the right series? For example, um, targeting nat netty is wrong. It should targeting netty proposed, for example, or netty security. Um, if it detects a problem, it will prompt you and say, "Okay, this or that went wrong." And you can fix it. So my netbook is too slow to show this whole process, but it will build the, uh, create the source package and build it and gives you, in, at the end, a Lintian log, a build log, and adaptive. Okay, so who's here is a KDE user? Come on, it's not a shame. We're free software too, so come on. <laughs> okay, science, we know that you love all, you love KDE. We have working, we are, we, we, are, uh, we are working on Plasma Active. Plasma Active is an initiative to provide a, key, a full KDE experience to tablet and mobile cell phones or devices. This is Plasma Active. So this, is, this code is like two weeks old, so just it could crash any time. So this is the basic shell. You can add plasmoids, for example, oh no, comic strip. Yeah. Configure them, so on. Then we have this thing called activities. Activities is in a way, is a way to organize your activities, what you want to do with your device or, or with your desktop. It's something like virtual desktops, but we try to integrate them with an application. So this is the activity switcher. It's hard to use it with touchpad, but you can see more or less the thing. You have photos activities, network, acti network, network activity, and so on. So this is Plasma Active. But Active is not only about a shell. It's also about applications. So for example, here we have an, a total, a full feature office suite made by, for tablet devices and cell phones. It works on sheets, presentations, and also with documents. It's full feature. You can even make a full presentation out of this. Then we have Aconadi. Aconadi is a piece of KIDI that allows you, it's, it's kind of a framework 
you ask to Akonadi, give me miles, and Akonadi provides. It's just that. So, thanks of Akonadi, we can have your emails in a full desktop application, such as Kmail, or you can have the same emails in a QML application. This is the mobile version of Kmail. So it's exactly the same emails and the same data. This is also now part of Plasma Active. But the fun of Kiddy technology doesn't end here. Then we have Nipomoc. Nipomoc, it's our semantic framework. It's a way to organize data like human brains does, which is it's using relationship between items. For example, if I find for community friendly, which is a demo document we use on Calligra, then Nepomuk has found the file, the actual file. This is not working, but in the future, near future, you will be able to share on Dropbox or plot the slide and so on. And then Nepomuk also found the emails where, from where this attachment comes from. So this is, uh, this in Plasma Active is called Contour. Is this, it's the project to, that brings Nipomuk technology to Plasma Active. And um, well, this is more or less it. You can see it. this is another concept. As I said, this code is like two weeks old. We are now working hard on it. So well, there's multiple technologies, well, concepts that we want to apply but they are not final. So this is it. So I want to show you today how can we deploy virtual machines in less than five minutes without asking any questions from the installer. And basically, it's for Ubuntu Server. And this comes from the work we've been doing with Cobbler and Cohen. And this is actually going to be in the next uh, in the release. This is going to be all automatically done with Orchestra. So we execute one command. We check our virtual machine, and while it installs, I'll explain a little bit of how is this done. So as you can see, everything is done automatically. So firstly, what do we do? The first step is important, I, uh, and Ubuntu ISO. Oh, OK, sorry. Uh, the first step is import an Ubuntu ISO with Cobbler, the second step is run the command that you can see there, which is basically a, a, tool, a helper tool that comes with Cobbler. We specify that it's a virtual machine. We specify the IP address of the server where the, where the Cobbler server. Then we specify which prof profile of the imported ISO we are going to use, which network interface we are going to use within the hypervisor, and what's the name of our virtual machine. See? It's States since it's installing. So the magic behind this is first using a preceed file. Uh, this preceed file was created by Dustin, and what it basically does is avoids having to uh, answer any questions and installs everything. Um, here we first actually uh, added something manually to be able to grab all the depths from the Cobbler import, imported ISO from the network, and through an in Cobbler we basically do one thing, which is change the preceed file and then add these two options. And that's it. This, of course, is going to go directly into Cobbler and it's going to do everything automatically and uh, into orchestra, I mean. And this is part of the work of the server team, Dustin, myself, uh, where Chuck, and Orchestra is part of the work from other guys as well in corporate services, Mark, uh, Juan. And if you want to know how to do it, how to deploy a, a, a Cobbler server, it's 
already documented, and if you want to use the precede file and install through Koan without actually having to answer any questions, it's also documented, and it's basically just running one command line. First, importing the ISO, and then running this command line to mod make the modifications, and then we can simply deploy our virtual machines. Don't delete that page. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the system has been finished, has installed, and I'll show you that it's actually there. So it has installed, please start. And we have our system. Thank you. Okay, so the Ubuntu community rocks, I have to say. Uh, so we're a startup, and we're a little unusual in that we do everything in the open, painfully so sometimes, um, and a super talented graphic designer who uses free software tools wanted to do a free brand and identity design for a project, and we've never met this person, Someone mentioned um, Novacut, and he decided that's what he wanted to do. And then about a month later, we get a 35-page PDF, and this is the rough draft of the brand identity guide. <coughs> guide. Um, he's still working on the final. So one thing we asked is we wanted the logo to be human, because like Ubuntu, although we're building technology, it's fundamentally about storytelling, which is very old and very human. And so over there in the corner is our new logo. Bunch of stuff with fonts. This guy is very, very, very thorough. We also wanted to match the Ubuntu color scheme. I don't know what an analogous color is or what that means, but apparently it means it looks cool. So that's awesome. <laughs> and that's our new logo.